Hi, everyone. It's the top of the hour, so it's time to get started. My name is Krista Reed. I am one of the senior project managers at Accelerant Research, and I'm very excited to introduce our next round of speakers, um, some awesome researchers coming to us from Zillow. So before we get started, there are just a few ground rules that I want to cover. We know that with being quarantined during this time, we're all having to leverage technology, which pretty much means we're at the mercy of technology. So let's just keep that in mind. Try to be as respectful and considerate of one another and any background noises or interruptions that might occur. Um, I know in the Charlotte area, the wind has been pretty rough. So if you're joining us virtually and have any of uh, mother nature impacting your connection as well, I totally understand. Um, let's use this time to network, engage and interact with one another. It's hard to connect in person because of the current times, but the great thing is that we do have technology and it's our resource to be able to stay connected. So with that, the formalities are out of the way. Today we have uh, Jenny, Lorenzo and Lauren coming to us from Zillow. They're going to talk about operational excellence and outcome driven approach for UX research. And with that, I'm excited to uh, take the screen off from me and move it on over to them. And I'll be back later to help field some of the questions we get from all of our participants. So thanks everyone for joining. And thank you, Jenny, Lorenzo, and Lauren for your time today. Awesome. Well, thank you, Krista, Bill, Accelerant Research um, for having us here today. We're really pumped to represent Zillow Group and share with you um, a framework that um, we, we built back in the fall of 2019, um, and we hope to get a lot of value out of. So just bear with me for a sec here. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Here we go. All right, can everyone see the title slide? Perfect. Okay, so to start, I um, wanted to introduce ourselves. So my name is Jenny Mangum, and I am a senior UX researcher at uh, Zilla Group. And there's 22 of us on a big centralized team at Zillow. And um, I specifically work on a small set of that team that's focused on ops related things. We do a little bit of measurement moving forward, um, doing more research enablement type of things that we're calling ourselves, working on tools, processes, frameworks, et cetera, to help all the other researchers on the team um, you know, be more effective and more efficient at their jobs. I'll hand it over to you, Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren Spore, and I am a principal UX researcher. I've been at Zillow for about six years now, and I actually started my career uh, on the customer insight side. So I was number two on that team and see that grow to, uh, um, I think we're probably on that side about 20 as well. Uh, and I have been on the UX research side for about two, uh, a little over two years now. And I am focused on uh, primarily understanding sellers within the Zillow offer space. So that's our line of business that focuses on buying and selling homes directly with customers. Great. Um, morning or good day, everyone. My name is Lorenzo. And uh, I too am on the Zillow research team. Um, my coverage area is mainly the course search. And so that's kind of the bread and butter of what um, Zillow is and has been. Um, essentially, when you come to the site, um, I help design and research pretty much the web as well as the uh, the apps. And uh, hard to believe, but I was actually the third researcher. When I joined Zillow, there were only three um, other researchers. Now we've grown to 22, which is really hard to believe. But um, I've been with the team for uh, almost three years now. And um, yeah, really looking forward to sharing our framework with you today. All right, so we have a ton of content we're going to cover today, and we're going to start by talking more about um, what UX research operational excellence is and the need for it. And um, even though we're drawing attention to UX research, we're all part of the UX research team here. We really believe there's application here um, for folks in market research, data science, really any discipline where you have to ask questions go get those answers and then share that with partners, stakeholders, clients, et cetera. So we really believe there's widespread application for this. Um, but we're gonna start there and then we're gonna um, go in depth how we've tackled this problem, our approach to this, um, you know, our approach to building this outcome focused framework and then talk more in depth about some of the applications that we've used it um, so far, how we hope to use it in the future and then just some final thoughts, key takeaways um, and get into any questions we didn't address along the way. All right, so 
Let's do it. What is UX research operational excellence? This is a pretty big question and it might um, bring to mind a couple different things. Some of these are things like process, having efficient processes, having effective processes, things like rigor and high quality. When you think of rigor and you might think of doing methods by the book, having big sample sizes or the right sample sizes, things like cleaning your data, having really, really high quality data. And of course, being user-centric, um, you know, that's the bread and butter of what we do, we're user-centric. So any way we, we attempt to define operational excellence has to focus on user-centric, customer-centric, that type of thing. These are a lot of different words, a lot of different concepts. They kind of fit together if you squint really hard um, and then you can take it down to that next level. Okay, so you have an individual. So you have a single um, practitioner, an individual UX researcher. What does it mean for them to produce high quality work? What does rigor look like for them? And then you bubble that up to a team. Um, you know, you have, yeah, you're introducing some more complications here. How does that differ from individuals? What, what makes a team operationally excellent versus an individual? And you can bubble that even higher to an organization where you have multiple teams perhaps. Um, where you have new things to consider, um, different types of politics, all that good stuff. It's just a lot to consider when you're thinking about operational excellence. And so for a little bit more context here, um, what we were tasked with uh, back in the fall of 2019 was trying to unpack how our UX research discipline at Zillow Group could be operationally excellent. And at the time, um, we were divided um, or, or organized into three different teams um, you know, according to three different lines of businesses. So we had our Zillow team, which had its own set of stakeholders and partners across design and product, a different line of business uh, premier agent, same thing, different, different partners that they were working with, different stakeholders, as well as Trulia, which you might also be familiar with there. And so at the time we had these three teams and we're using similar tools, somewhat similar processes, despite our different partners and whatnot. Um, you know, wouldn't it make sense for us to come together and talk about and align on what it means to be operationally excellent so that we're not repeating the same thing three different times. We're not putting energy and effort into building up these processes that perhaps other folks are already doing within Zillow Group. So that was our big question is what does being operationally excellent mean for us as a discipline? And yeah, we had to go figure that out. So how do we do that? Well, it all started with an outcome-driven approach as our foundation. Um, and you, know, you might ask, what does that even mean? <laughs> what is an outcome-driven approach? And it's pretty simple, really. Um, what it really boils down to is articulating you know, users and state, their user needs, and what success looks like for getting there. You may look at that and say, OK, like that, it's a ton of buzzwords. What is going on here? And so we're going to break that down a little bit more. So really, it's just about solving for the most important user problems or jobs. This is what we do on the product side, is uh, we do a ton of work to articulate and figure out what is that most important need or unmet need, whether, whether defined or undefined, um, you know, figure that out, and then we go solve for that. And you can also you know, think about this in terms of jobs. I know there's a ton of literature around jobs to be done, and purists with that theory might kind of Ah, like scoff at, at mixing that with outcome driven, but they're so similar. And for you know, sake of simplicity, and just think about this as solving for the most important things people do, their jobs. And breaking that down a little bit further, you have a who, you have a person doing something, which is the job, and some measure of success. Okay. So this is the type of you know thinking and approach that we are already doing on the product side. Our director of UX research, Andrew Mayer. Um, you know, really, really, um, you know, worked hard to, to bring us up, up off the ground and bring it over to Zillow and really um, evangelize this way of thinking across the organization. And so on the left here, um, you see um, an outcome. Movers find homes based on state of criteria. You have that who, which is the mover in this case, and you have that what, that job, which is find homes based on state of criteria. And then you can add on that, you know, what does it mean to do well piece to it? In this case, accurately and efficiently. And who's doing it? Well, us, Zillow, we're doing this. So we are that tool, that solution that's helping a mover find homes based on the criteria that they state. 
And so we have over 100 of these outcomes that we have built up um, across selling, buying, renting, uh, being a landlord, being an agent. And we've organized these into maps that we have for each of these key personas um, that chronologically list the most important outcomes all these users are trying to do. And so the team, you know, Lauren Lorenzo built these up from scratch and um, you know, were already using these as, as, you know, throughout all phases of our research. So why couldn't we take this approach and apply it to ourselves as researchers? And that's exactly what we did. And so what does that look like? Well, if we go back to that simple, you know, syntax of an outcome, you have the who, you have the job, you have some measure of success, and this is all building up to designing products that are operationally excellent. And so in this case, we have the who, we're looking at ourselves, we're looking at our own discipline, we're looking at UX researchers, that's our who. We have our end goal in mind. We want to figure out what is operational excellence for our discipline. We just need to fill in those middle parts. Sounds really simple. Um, you know, we should know our jobs, we should know what we're doing, and we should know what it means to do that well. But breaking this down in this way um, really helped give us just a place to start and to, to start doing this. And so taking a step back here, why bother doing all this? Why bother taking this outcome-driven approach, applying it onto our cells? Seems like a lot of work. Don't really know if it's necessary. Like, what are we doing here? Well, there's a couple different benefits. And one is that this is just inherently solution agnostic, which um, is so exciting. So you could think about a researcher's jobs that, and, and build these outcomes that are totally method agnostic. So whether you're doing a card sort, whether you're doing a giant survey, whatever you're doing, you're still trying to answer some sort of question, regardless of that method. You can also think about it just being totally org agnostic. If we're doing it in Trulia, if we're doing it in Zillow, if we're doing it in Premier Agent, in theory, we're still trying to complete the same core job so it could apply across all these different teams and organizations, which is pretty exciting, it had a lot of potential to scale. Another reason is that outcomes are scoped and measurable. So in having um, you know, a collection of these units you could actually analyze, oh my gosh, we could actually gauge our success, measure our progress and do so many cool things with that, which uh, teaser we actually did. Um, there's more to come on that later. And then the third piece here is that, you know, like we mentioned, we're already doing this on the product side. It was familiar to a lot of the research practitioners on our team. A lot of the ICs, management, are already pretty well steeped in this outcome-driven thinking. And within Zillow, we are calling these experience outcomes. So you see the short form XOs there. Um, that's, that's just the lingo that we were calling these on the product side. So with this in mind, um, this already being sort of a shared team foundation, there was really minimal onboarding and minimal work that we would need to do to get folks um, you know, thinking this way. So tons of benefits. So we, we plowed forward. So thanks, Jenny. So our next step was to actually build this outcome-driven map. Uh, and so we kind of had a, a high-level um, process of what we did to get there. So we're going to walk you through that. So the first thing is we actually had a core team of lead individual contributors uh, on uh, across our different uh, UX research groups come together and think about how we could create a solution for what it means to be operationally excellent. So uh, as we were talking about different uh, potential solutions or frameworks, we kind of had this moment of, oh my gosh, what if we use the experience outcome framework. And I remember us kind of sitting in a collective room and we just went Psh, like, you know, oh my gosh, this is mind blowing. What if we did it to ourselves? We've been doing it to customers. You know, we've been applying this to, to sellers and buyers and agents. And then we also recently started um, doing this with some of our internal operators to better understand you know, their, their needs and their goals of their jobs so we could apply um, you know, solutions for them. And so it was really, uh, again, this light bulb moment where we realized we could turn, turn it completely on its head and apply it toward ourselves and our jobs. So in terms of the process, obviously, you know, we wanted to review it with our management team. They were super jazzed, excited, kind of gave us the big thumbs up. Uh, and actually Jenny was the person to say, you know what, I've got this, like, I'm super, I'm super jazzed about this. Let me take on and develop a, a draft framework for us to start from. And so that was really beneficial because we weren't starting from scratch, but we knew that um, we wanted to get a lot of the team involvement as well. So we used an upcoming uh, UX research offsite and, and we say offsite, but it was actually onsite, but now that's, seems like a dream where we could come together 
together in a room. So the, we were kind of pulling together photos from a year ago. And we're like, remember when we were together? Remember when we could share food? Like, it just feels so foreign. But um, yeah, it was just a year ago where we came together. Uh, next slide, I'll go through uh, kind of our core steps. So the first one is we wanted uh, as a group, we just kind of sat down again together in that room, but we could do it um, virtually as well if we were uh, creating it uh, this year, but we really wanted to align on the high level phases of our uh, framework. So things like framing the research, constructing research design, execution, analyzing and ultimately inspiring and uh, you know, getting others to act on, on our, our findings is uh, the high level things that we wanted to get uh, alignment on. And then really, is there anything missing? So we wanted to make sure that we didn't have any big glaring gaps. And then we actually created a team activity where we had in independent brainstorming via post-it. So, you know, we're always a big fan in uh, design sprints or various things like that of using post-its just to kind of have individual thought uh, and, and coming together. And really this was breaking down, you know, when you think of your role, your day-to-day, -day, either currently or in uh, times past, what are common, common jobs or tasks that you as a researcher go through? So um, when you're thinking about framing the research problem, you know, what are different things that you do? And so we really wanted to use this as a way to get that comprehensive uh, and, and um, robust, you know, feedback uh, across all of our, uh, both individual contributors and managers when we were thinking about this. And this slide really just kind of encapsulates uh, the process. So in the post-its, we asked, what are you doing and why are you doing it? So some examples uh, for the first what is, well, you know, I've got to reach out to initial stakeholders and additional stakeholders to gather my questions. Um, why? Well, I want to make sure that my research is broadly applicable. So we just again applied that um, just similar thought all the way through the different phases. Once we had that, we actually did a different uh, team activity where we broke uh, folks out into teams of two and each team of two focused on one specific phase. So one uh, group got frame, one group got construct. Um, you can see Lorenzo there pointing. He's really working uh, deeply with Antonio uh, on, I think it's probably, is it frame? It looks like an earlier one, but we really used um, the full uh, you know, room to the advantage to kind of put um, things together to start affinitizing those post-its and grouping them under um, phases and sub-phases. Uh, and once we did that, we were able to kind of recheck again, Jenny's initial draft to say, okay, this is really great. It looks like we've got a lot of support for, you know, this specific job or, oh, you know what? I think we missed this component. So we might um, reframe this job um, just slightly to incorporate that new feedback. And then the last one, we actually had each group of two uh, present to the team and then folks took individual notes and then we shared uh, those additional questions, comments. We kind of just like pushed and stretched and pulled a little bit on it. And ultimately uh, each uh, group had one person responsible for kind of aligning that feedback. And then um, we had our core team uh, inclusive of Jenny and Lorenzo and I and some other folks uh, really figure out um, how to uh, finalize this and make sure that it is um, where we wanted to kind of land off. I do see one question come up. Uh, the jobs to be done framework is absolutely an input for this. Um, I would say we use pr primarily um, the experience outcome framework that we had used on the product side, but definitely it is born out of um, jobs to be done um, as one input for sure. I'll hand it back over to Jenny to introduce um, what we came up with. So now we're going to walk you through um, the framework piece by piece that we built. And um, a, a great place to start with this is in that execute phase. Like this is the core of what we do as researchers. If you're going to start out, say, as a junior IC, you know, this is this is the place that, that you go. You're, you're collecting data. You're collecting whatever is the necessary data that you need to answer your question. And so the two outcomes that we have here under collect data are capture behavior. So things like observations or events. And you can think about this in so many different ways, um, whether you're doing observation in a usability study, observation, um, doing some ethnography, observation, um, collecting events of a data scientist, et cetera. So that's one flavor of it, as well as all that attitudinal data. So, um, you know, things like self-report, whether it's through a survey, a site intercept, 
um, in an interview, a dyad, et cetera, et cetera. All, all these tons of different methods can help you tackle this. But at the core, when you're executing research, you're capturing behavior and you're capturing attitudes. And from here, you can start building this outwards. So, all right, you've executed and collected some data. Now what? Uh, you can analyze it. And there's a bunch of different phases involved here. Um, you know, the first step would be assessing that quality of the data um, through, through the outcomes that we have listed there. And then you're extracting findings from that collected data. And to do so, you're organizing it, identifying patterns. You're mining the data for facts and findings, and then you're capturing those findings and insights. And again, because this is a solution of not agnostic, um, you know, following the similar jobs to be done uh, framework that Lauren mentioned there, we're not telling you or, or prescribing how, it's just that you know, the act of capturing those findings and insights is identified as one of those outcomes. And then moving down the line, uh, determining the implications for those findings. So now that you have those findings, now what? Do you actually answer that original research question? Um, how do you, you know, synthesize those findings with all the existing knowledge that you might have in that space? Aligning those findings within the broader business context as well as articulating actionable next steps. So it's one thing to just say what happened, but it's another step to say, okay, now what? So what uh, with those findings? And then you can bolt on that phase that comes before execute. Um, and this is what we're calling that construct phase. And you might think of this as designing an approach and whatnot, but design is just a murky term, especially as, as we work with so many design partners that we landed on uh, construct. And so as part of that initial construct phase that comes before actually executing the work, you're doing a bunch of different things. So you're designing that approach to answering the question, which involves tons of different steps. So determining what methodology could be used to actually answer that research question, determining what materials you need to carry out the research. This could be uh, writing survey questions, building a discussion guide, um, you know, getting your hands on a prototype, whether you build it yourself or need to work with partners to get that, all those steps to just determine those materials and then actually producing them. So doing the work to, to make those come to life once you identify them. And then of course, recruiting the right people, the right participants to ensure that they are representative of your target audience, whatever that might be. And then another piece of construct that follows that is setting up uh, the research activities, whatever those might be. So um, that could involve preparing the research participants for data collection. And depending on what type of method or what type of work you're doing, that could be so many different things. Um, providing context, um, you know, hey, show up here at this particular time. Here's a video link, providing homework, priming them in some way. So many different ways that, that you could do that. Um, to then preparing uh, your partners, stakeholders, clients, et cetera, for that data collection. And that could be things like, rules of engagement. Um, again, show up here at this particular time, here's a video link, et cetera. And then two more outcomes here is preparing the research environment for data collection. Nowadays, that could be just closing the, the tabs in your browser. It could be um, you know, ensuring tools are ready, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, the last one that we have there is preparing the structure to collect data. And what this is really doing is setting you up for execution and analysis. Um, to try to expedite that. So, so many different ways you can do that again, whether it's building a spreadsheet ahead of time, um, making a template and a notebook, etc. And so we have these three phases. Now we can still bolt on two more. At the end, um, you know, once you've collected your data, analyzed it, ultimately you want to inspire. So you want to drive action with partners and stakeholders. And we have two outcomes listed here, um, which is communicate findings, insights, and implications to partners and stakeholders, which is a lot. Again, you can take you take a finding, build it up to an insight, and then distill next steps and implications for them. So that's that first outcome. And then the second one is helping partners implement those insights. And um, as you probably noticed at this point, you know, these outcomes might not all be necessary for you tackling a given research problem. They might not all be necessary for you in your role or, or at your level in your career, et cetera. Um, but nevertheless, if you were to do it all, <laughs> this help partners implement insights is a key piece. And then lastly, frame. So this is that first step that comes before 
all the rest where um, you need to figure out the research need. Um, it's a pretty big, important step. It's a very first step. And then doing so, there could be a bunch of different outcomes involved here. So determining partners and stakeholders, um, determining the goals and questions that they might have, um, determining what decisions uh, will be informed by research. And you know what, what happens many times uh, for myself, I know others as well, is you might you know, start down that path of determining partners, determining goals and questions, and then determine that it's not gonna impact a decision. So then you stop right there and that, that stops that process for you. Um, anyways, like moving down that list, uh, triangulating articulated needs with existing knowledge. That's a big one. So, you know, you have these goals and questions coming in. Well, what do you already know? When you, when you hook up all those things together, when you synthesize all that, now what? Um, what's the question? What's the goal? How does that change? And then lastly, under the figure out the research need, um, determine whether or not to move forward with new research. So I mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, maybe it's a time where you pause and you just, you, you don't move forward in the process because there's not a need um, to, to actually conduct and execute the research. And then, so once you figure out that need in general, then you can move on to defining the questions to be answered. And then we have three outcomes listed here, which is trans, um, translating those articulated needs and questions that partners and stakeholders have into research questions that you can go tackle and think about what methods you would use to do so. And then there's a prioritization element to that. Many times we're not gonna go tackle the dozens and dozens of questions that are top of mind for folks. So we have to prioritize those and um, you know, distill down which ones we can actually address um, in the upcoming research. And then lastly here, identifying constraints. Um, so a lot of times, um, you know, there's so many things that pop up, we're not just working in a bubble. Um, there's timing, uh, budget, et cetera, et cetera, all these things that we need to balance and juggle um, that, that really inform how we then construct our approach. And so this is a full end-to-end -end research process. It's a lot. And, um, you know, it, when we were building this, we wanted to represent the breadth of what we could do if we were to truly do a project from end to end. And again, these might not all be relevant and that's okay. You might, you might do a couple of these. Um, you might start framing, then you hand it off to someone else, a different tool, a different person, a different agency, et cetera, to do that constructing the executing, et cetera. Um, that's kind of the beauty of it being solution agnostic is we're not saying how you do it, but rather these are all the steps that you do. All right, but that's not it <laughs> because then we have these wonderful things uh, that we call key enablers. And so as you, um, as you were getting the super speed read of our framework map, um, a couple of things might've popped up of all these additional factors that are really important that are factors, I should call outcomes that are really important as you're going through and, and doing your research process that just aren't really addressed there. These are things that are horizontal and in theory, like show up at every single phase. These are things that are catalysts to you completing those outcomes. And we group them into a bunch of different buckets here um, in terms of organizational influence. So those are the relationships that you have with partners and stakeholders. Um, the confidence that your stakeholders and partners have in you, um, whether it's as a researcher or as a team. Um, and then you know your ability to align and drive consensus. That's a skill, that's an outcome um, that, that takes time to, to build up and, and time to build. So we have organizational, we have technical competence, same type of deal, um, practical skills. So things just like coordinating time, reviewing work, um, communicating intentionally um, and having a sense of work-life balance. Um, that's an outcome we really wanted on here. It's important. Um, and especially, um, you know, to Solo and, and, and our team. And then lastly, a couple more here, uh, we have adhering to regulations and standards that didn't show up in that outcome out. And it's really important that we do that um, to be to do ethical and, and you know, follow the, our company policies as, as we do our work. Um, you know, ensuring that others, uh, you know, can find insights. So this is talking about more, more um, ops related things. So, Maybe you, you go and do that end-to-end -end, uh, you know, research, but now what? <laughs> what if people can't find it? Um, you know, there's, there's all these little hops type things that are pretty important here. And so 
that is it. That is um, our research network, UX researcher framework. Um, now, I'm going to pass it over to you, uh, Lorenzo, to talk more about how we've used this framework. We, we did see a quick question on there and we wanted to note um, it was about collaboration and um, you know if we have any ideas about that. And I think we have a, a section later on about collaboration, which we'll fold into. So no worries, we definitely saw the question. Uh, we just didn't want to break up um, Jenny's presentation, but we'll be sure to address it. Great. So we've gone through this process. We've talked about the framework we've created. You know, we've, we've reflected on, you know, what we do as a discipline, the, the different phases, the different activities, the different tasks, the different jobs, if you will. And I'm sure many of you are wondering now, you know, what's the purpose? Like, why, why are we doing this? What was this activity really for? And so I want to dive into some of the applications that we have um, come about from this exercise and really dive into some of the more specifics about like how we're using this and how we're continuing to use this. Now keep in mind that many of these are works in progress. Um, it's been a year in the making, but uh, you know, it's still being evolved and will continue to be evolved. But um, some of the things that we've done really talk about, you know, how do we activate this? How are we measuring you know, quality? We also wanna talk a little bit about um, how are we using this in our hiring practices and you know, bringing in candidates and uh, you know, formulating questions that really ladder up and align to these different phases and these different activities that we've identified as a discipline you know, should be providing for our clients and our customers. Um, Lauren's gonna talk a little bit more about how we are using this framework to really assess our overall um, team's performance. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about future applications. Now, when we think about, um, you know, how we're planning to use this for measuring quality, it's really about like, what is research quality look like? And so when we came out of the, um, the activity, you know, we'd been in a room for one day, we had a couple of weeks follow up to really identify, you know, what this framework would look like. We wanted to know, you know, what is the output of this? What is, what is quality? And really the questions came about, if you go to the previous slide. Uh, can, you, uh, can you go to the previous slide, Jenny? Sorry, one more. The goals were really around, you know, how do we develop an approach and really set a bar for what research quality is in our team. And some questions that were coming out from management and from other team members were really, how do we you know, create a quality bar for what we identify as quality in research? How do we ensure that we're maintaining this as we go throughout our practice, as we go throughout these steps and activities that we've identified? And really, how do we work to improve the overall quality of our team? Now, the first part of this process is really trying to identify like what is research quality look like um, you know for each one of these phases where we've got you know all the way from the beginning where we're meeting with team members we're starting to engage with them gather questions all the way to the very last phase where we're really looking at that aspect of you know activating those findings those insights and working with the team to really you know get those implemented and so a follow-up to this was a series of workshops where we brought our team together to really gather input on what high quality looks like. Now being a key component in the development of this framework, we really wanted to maintain that level of collaboration. And this was super critical to get team alignment and also team input on like what quality is. Next slide. Um, now, as part of this activity, we also wanted to determine what does it mean to be successful in each of these phases in our framework? Now, if you remember Jenny presenting a slide on, you've got the, the activity itself for each one of the phases, this example here is when we start to design the approach to answering the question. What we're lacking for each one of these is really how do we know we're successful? And for that, we held a workshop, we did a bunch of posted affinity exercises. Those type of things are really get at, you know, our level, when, when are we gonna know we're successful? And so if you think about when you're designing the approach to answering a question, success is often seen as when we're confident we've selected the most appropriate method. Or for example, when we've done due diligence, we've reviewed previous research and are consulted with experts and leads on the team. Next slide. Um, as part of the next step for this, we wanted to really create, gather, organize, and really take inventory of 
you know, what exists within our current team and even beyond, you know, many of the um, members of our team come from diverse backgrounds. They've worked in different companies, different industries, but they all bring a wealth of knowledge. And so we really leverage that to, you know, start collecting like what activities exist out there, what templates, what are some examples that the team can provide that really exemplify high quality. And we started to get those together. We started to gather them. We started to take inventory of what we had and what we didn't have. We ultimately sought to kind of start filling in the blanks to really understand, for example, um, you know, when you're constructing <clears throat> your research, one example was to collect um, artifacts that we as a team had for like study plans for different types of studies. You know, we all have these kind of hidden away in our, um, you know, our own personal drives, but the effort was really to try to collect these, to try to gather them. And then ultimately as the next slide <clears throat> displays, we wanted to build a way that we could share these out with the rest of the team. And as you'll see as part of the next process, this involved really um, placing these in, in an area where they were easily accessible and also bringing about awareness that we do have these practices, these guidelines, these templates, these examples, you know, that we've created over the years. And that, you know, as researchers, we never start from ground zero. You know, the wheel's already been, been invented. So why not leverage that and evolve to the next level? Um, and the next step with this was really to ensure that we have processes in place to set standards and expectations with the team and maintain high quality over time. Now, this is still a work in progress, but some initial steps we've made to start activating the framework is really um, building processes. One example would be to ensure that you know, all study, study plans we have are reviewed with peers prior to launch. And this isn't a, a heavy set rule. It can be more organic in peer meetings, but we should always start with senior manager level or one level above just to start to maintain you know, some level of quality as far as what we are producing um, within our practice. And I want to talk a little bit about the output of this and the next steps. Um, so as I mentioned a couple times here, this is evolving. We've, uh, we've only started to activate this, but our efforts are really um, targeted towards continuing to activate the framework. And part of that's going to be identifying other processes that can serve to facilitate this high quality. And also um, just exploring and continuing to explore other ways in which we can maintain quality you know, throughout the activities that our teams are performing. Now, another uh, part of this effort um, that came out, this is super important, um, was we were approached by our managers to, um, to start thinking about, you know, how can we use this for interviewing candidates? You know, bringing in candidates, understandably the problem is we've got, as I mentioned, a very diverse group of people. Each, we were starting to notice there was a lot of inconsistency within the questions that were asked. Um, invariably, that can lead to, you know, complications when you're evaluating a candidate. And so the questions here were really, how can we be more consistent in the questions we're asking? You know, how can we be more equitable, objective in how we're evaluating candidates as we're bringing them through? Then ultimately, how can we make this process more efficient so that we're not having to, you know, dig through files and pull together our own question sets and really just, you know, make it as effortless as possible. Um, now with that in mind, um, you know, we, we wanted to try to start identifying success here. And really that's, you know, to make it easy for our hiring managers to, you know, you're hiring for a certain role, what's a question set that you want to use that? And then ultimately, how can those align back to the framework that we've created? And to really start to accomplish this, we leaned heavily on the framework that we designed. Um, now within the framework, as you've noticed, this identifies things that we should be providing for our clients, for our teams, for our customers. And so we started wanting to start gathering and synthesizing the most common questions we asked during interviews. And this was an effort that really took, you know, bringing all these different templates, these different guidelines, these different sets of questions we had from all our different managers. And also we looked to uh, forums and other sources, um, you know, within the community to try to see what are some common questions and ultimately how do they identify you know, people who are good within the framing, within construct, within execute, and all of these different phases and activities that we have deemed to be important as a discipline. Our next step was really to start aligning these with each phase to make sure that we had coverage within each one of these different phases. And if we didn't, 
to start beefing up or understand if we needed to beef up and have questions for each one of the phases that we didn't. And ultimately, we started to look at, you know, if we have a set of questions, how can we start to understand leveling for each question? You know, how can we ask, or do we need to ask a question for someone who's entry level versus someone who may be senior or principal? And if so, what do those questions look like and how do they align to the framework? And we worked with our team leadership to start vetting questions, aligning on leveling. And this is one we've started about a month ago and we will be continuing to activate um, in our upcoming candidate interviews. Now the output for this one is super critical. We wanna bring in the highest level of quality candidates that we can that really meet the standards that we've determined to be important as researchers. And we're gonna to continue to start using the question bank as we interview candidates and ultimately evolving it through usage. Um, this will include the addition and deletion of questions. We'll start refining our criteria for leveling and just really determine what works and doesn't work. So now I'll pass it off to Lauren to talk a little bit more about another way that we've been using the um, framework. Yeah, so we wanted to use this to develop a better understanding of where we're at collectively with our skills on the team. And uh, we uh, kind of brainstormed all the different ways that we could evaluate ourselves. It's always kind of fun to do, not even just research on research, it's research on researchers. Uh, and uh, we had a couple of different uh, leadership frameworks and, and things uh, used at Zillow, and, as well as um, externally, where we developed um, uh, this uh, three kind of components of evaluation. So the first one is competence. So on a scale of one to five, uh, rating your own uh, level of ability. So you can see an example there um, is, you know, one very low to none, uh, all the way up to very high. Again, on uh, competence is the first one. Uh, motivation is the motivation for you to grow in your own competence. So how excited are you? Um, how much of the kind of intrinsic uh, inspiration is, is coming from you that to say, you know, I'm not there yet, but I, I'm really excited to do that. And then the last level is just about a, a competence measure. So confidence you can grow given your current opportunities. And uh, that was a little bit open-ended and we kind of did that intentionally. So whether it was your specific role on the team or your um, you know, level of ability uh, given you felt like where you were at versus where you wanted to be, um, just general sense of confidence. And we wanted to share kind of high level uh, findings uh, for, for you here. Um, and we shared, uh, ultimately we shared this um, with the managers just to kind of give them a sense of, of where the team is at. And we're still kind of working through potential opportunities which we'll talk about in the next section. But some high level takeaways in terms of competency, uh, we really measured ourselves highest uh, in terms of uh, qualitative research. Uh, we are a group uh, predominantly uh, with qualitative methodological backgrounds. Um, and particularly in the setup phases. So when Jenny was talking about, uh, you know, people coming in and feeling strongest in the um, execute and construct um, phases, we see that kind of reflected in the data. Uh, we measured ourselves lowest in quantitative areas, uh, particularly in assessing the qualitative data. So that um, is identified as a potential gap in our team. Uh, again, with open questions to managers as to the solutions for improving on that. You know, is that okay? Is that something that we feel that, um, you know, another team, data science or um, customer insights would maybe take on that type of methodological approaches? Or is that something that we want to um, kind of fill the gap on, on our team because we want to be more um, robust and comprehensive? From a motivation per, uh, perspective, we are motivated to increase that organizational in, influence and also just grow our general practical skills. The lowest, um, it's interesting that we, um, the improvement in areas where we rate ourselves as confident, um, plus setting up uh, quant research is where um, we definitely want to improve in our motivation or are motivated to improve. And then the last piece is confidence. Um, we are most confident we can grow in areas where we're motivated. So, um, you know, kind of seeing those synergies there, some correlation there, at least slightly, uh, including that organizational influence and then also driving action with uh, stakeholders and partners. Uh, and lowest is areas where we do feel least confident, um, again, particularly in the quant areas. So that was identified as the biggest gap on our team, but maybe on other teams, you would be stronger in quant and a gap um, might be in qualitative areas. 
And then um, we kind of have been thinking as well about future applications. So kind of riffing off of that, identifying skills on the team, uh, we felt that you could also use that to identify skill masters and potentially set up kind of a mentoring opportunity where people can collectively know, um, you know, oh, I really want to go to Lorenzo for, for this um, area, or oh, I really want to go to Jenny uh, for this area. And again, setting up those opportunities for learning uh, from uh, folks that have really honed their skills and are seen as experts uh, on the team. Another area is to help set goals and measure progress against those goals. So if you are, you know, conducting your own analysis on yourself and you're kind of reviewing that with your manager, is that, you know, something that can be used to help to say, I really want to grow in this area and what are different, um, you know, opportunities or uh, different, um, you know, ways that I can start to grow and build on that success criteria for that specific um, job. and transition it over to key learnings, uh, what worked. So what we uh, kind of took away from when we were kind of going through and using this as an opportunity to say, you know, yeah, what did we think was, um, you know, really particularly um, successful about the way that, um, you know, we worked through that initially. And then also um, as we created, you know, specific or additional follow-up from this, um, we really felt that involving the team up front helped create a sense of shared ownership, but not starting from scratch. So we would have definitely had a longer, we, would, we wouldn't have had time in the full off site to just to, to come and even, you know, us as a core team kind of spun our wheels a little bit to kind of get, you know, that high level, um, you know, theoretical to a direct application. So again, kudos to Jenny for really taking that on and, and giving us something to work from that really definitely helped. And identifying potential use cases up front, we actually saw the most momentum on things where we had identified, well, gosh, how could we use this uh, before we actually created and finalized the framework? So that really gave us a springboard to say, okay, now that we have this framework, let's immediately, you know, have Lorenzo take on, you know, the quality piece and Lauren, you take on this piece and Jenny, you take on this piece. And that really, again, allowed us to um, kind of build that momentum um, throughout the whole process. Uh, and the last one is just finding ways to incorporate with other um, frameworks or, or well-known things um, that are comfortable and, and known with the team that just helped us kind of better understand how to incorporate it. So when Lorenzo was talking about um, the question bank, we really wanted to try and code the questions not only by um, the outcome framework uh, for product research, but then also um, different things like we have focus skills and broad skills. And so we could say, well, this question not only addresses, you know, this framing piece of it, it also addresses this core skill. So again, you can kind of squint and see how um, there are some similarities across other frameworks. And if we move to the next slide here. As always, there's um, opportunity for improvement. Um, with anything that we um, that we do, we always like to look and reflect back and say, how could we have done this better? And one of the things that we identified was really holding the core team accountable. And uh, this is really about being deliberate and persistent with milestones, with deliverables. And it's a little process heavy, but it's something that we, we identified that we didn't quite have when we um, started implementing this. But moving forward, we're, we're definitely going to look at, you know, just having persistence with um, with our goals and you know where we're at within the process. As mentioned, um, you know, in the um, activation part is you know continuing to evolve and really having a plan to come up with um, additional uses. We've explored some, but in the future, what we're looking to is really to get back with the team and start to explore other ways that we might activate the framework itself. Last but not least is um, ensuring that we are maintaining and growing our shared knowledge. Um, understandably, within our company as well as others, we have reorgs, we have new team members joining, we have team members who may not be familiar with this process, and really just coming about a process in a way to make sure that we're maintaining and continuing to implement and activate um, our framework. All right, and one other thing uh, we're just really, really excited about is some of the other opportunities um, for how we could uh, you know, use this framework with some of the other research disciplines at Zillow. And so a couple of different ways uh, we, we hope to use this is just to better educate our colleagues on what we do and what we don't do. Um, you know, it, it goes a long way being able to articulate and, and talk about our process. 
and um, even then applying some of the tools that we use to do that process to help people um, you know, get us involved earlier, get us involved more often in a lot of the very, in many of the initiatives um, that, that we work with partners on. And then on the flip side, uh, we can use this to better understand what other related disciplines do. Uh, market research, um, you know, data science, um, you know, behavioral sciences. Uh, we have this, this foundation, this framework that we, that we can talk about our process. So we can use that to then um, you know, better understand others' processes and how those could fit together um, or not. And that, that leads into this last one here, it's just helping Zillow um, as an organization um, better understand how to leverage each of the research related disciplines, um, you know, given there's so many of us, which, which is fantastic, but you know, how do we work together? How do we work in isolation? Um, you know, just being able to facilitate operational excellence at a larger scale is really, really exciting, um, you know, to open up more opportunities for us to work together, to tackle questions that might even be similar, that it just require, uh, you know, slightly different approach or a mixed method approach. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that we can really um, activate on this piece specifically. All right. So just some final thoughts here uh, before, before we wrap up is that you know, the exercise that we went through to build this map, to build this framework, and ultimately just build this shared understanding of what we do, what our team does, what the UX research discipline at Zillow does is super, super valuable in and of itself. Um, and you know, a couple of reasons is that it can just break down misconceptions about what we do. Um, it, can, it can you know give you space to have those conversa conversations, eliminate similarities, even though you know at the time um, our, our discipline was across a whole bunch of different lines of businesses, we're doing a lot of the same stuff, <laughs> tackling a lot of the same questions. Um, we have a lot of similarities, and you know, doing this type of activity, this type of exercise, has really illuminated that. And then lastly. Um, you know, all those applications that we talked about, this really sets a foundation to do those things, to have that shared language and these, these you know, units of analysis that we can then layer all these things onto. So uh, we're really excited about how durable this type of, this type of work is, this framework is, and all the things that it sets us up to do moving forward. And so, you know, there's no one way to build it, you know, true to the outcome-driven approach, jobs to be done, how you build it, totally up to you. Um, but we really encourage you um, to, you know, do the work to, to build that understanding and then, you know, put it to use in whatever way um, is valuable to you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for, you know, having us here today, um, you know, listening to us, um, you know, asking questions. And if you have any more, we're really happy to discuss and answer them with us again. We do have that first one from uh, Susan and she was asking, I think this was kind of um, upfront when we were talking about the offsite and the creation of this, but question um, to you, Lorenzo and Jenny, and I'll give a stab at it as well, is you know, how have we approach collaboration and workshopping um, as a team during um, this kind of working from home experience? And what have you seen maybe work and, and um, maybe need to be adapted uh, as we shift to a different, different world? Yeah, so I can uh, I can answer that one, or at least provide some uh, perspective on that. Um, yeah, I mean the work the work doesn't stop. Um, you know, we continued to have to um, push forward through these uh, you know these trying times, and um, we have uh, we've definitely done a few different collaborative efforts um, that come to mind. Um, those being I've I've sat in on a few different design sprints, which are typically held in person, and uh, you know, initially when, when COVID hit, we, we saw these as a challenge and, you know, particularly being difficult as these are typically held within a, a single room. We typically get in a conference room, we'll, you know, have 20 to 30 people and, and they'll literally collaborate for, you know, a week straight. And um, I will say that it's been a work in progress and it has been an overall um, evolving process. Um, some of the initial ones we had were you know, trying to reflect exactly what we what we were doing in a room, virtually, we saw and identified some things that worked, some things that didn't work. But I can say is, you know, this last sprint um, fairly successful in some of the processes and methods that we we took from those learning activities. Uh, you know, specifically being the usage of collaborative tools that allow us to 
you know, affinitize and, and post notes as we would in person. One tool we use, um, you know, for that specifically is Mural, which has been fairly effective. Um, and, you know, somewhat of a learning curve for people to start using that and adapt to it, but super, super helpful. I think another thing that's been particularly helpful is really um, dividing up what would have been, you know, complete collaboration. And that's, you know, everyone in a room all together for every one of those days for, you know, nine to five. We've had particular success dividing it up into shorter time frames. And so, you know, we'll have three to four hour sessions together. We'll divide that up with breakout rooms, which um, thankfully uh, Zoom is very capable of handling. And uh, those allow us to really kind of, you know, get with smaller groups rather than have, you know, immersive time with everyone. And then we've also had success dividing up some of the activities to more kind of heads down individual, particularly in some of the ideation phases where you really just need to take some time away, you know, really get your thoughts together and kind of focus. And those are just a, a few of the things that I think have been fairly successful that I've seen. Jenny, Lauren? Yeah, from my perspective, I think some of the um, the early things were really just a learning process and kind of saying what's working, what's not working. And one of the things that um, we we kind of understood is sometimes there are applications like Mural that work really well when you've got designers who are well versed in that versus if you've got a lot of product managers or people coming in, it's like, just use Google Docs, just create a space where you ask questions and people just plunk in together. We also have created some uh, Google Slides where you have some um, of the you know slides that's actually kind of fixed and you can't move. And then I've had a designer and she just copied what looked like post-its and she just copied 60 one over the other. So everyone was dragging and dropping and just it looked like magic, but it, she just copied and pasted 60 you know things over each other with text boxes. You just add it and then organize. So I would say. Um, there's another question here about what techniques work even better now that everyone's in a virtual environment. I would say um, we had a lot of folks in our Seattle office, but then we also have a lot of counterparts in San Francisco and increasingly in different areas. And so when if, if you were not in that room, it was really hard to share a voice and you're kind of trying to have this one camera, you're kind of saying, okay, we're whiteboarding over here, but you can't really see it. And so I would say um, it's kind of equalized that playing field in terms of everyone's remote and everyone's coming from that same either advantage or disadvantage, depending upon your perspective. And then also not the just the loudest voice in the room um, can kind of control things. So I feel like the, you know, sharing of perspectives is a little bit more democratized. Jenny, do you have anything else you wanted to add? Nope, totally nailed it. Couldn't agree more. I'm not sure if we have any other questions. We do have a couple minutes left, but I will we'll hand it back over to you know, Krista if you wanna take it from here. Thank you so much. Um, so I think, let's see, I saw another pop-up. We might have just gotten one more question. Oh no, that was a, so the first um, question that we received, they just responded to say thank you. So on behalf of those who asked questions, thank you. On behalf of Accelerant Research, thank you to Jenny, Lorenzo, and Lauren. This was a great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed seeing the colorfulness of the post-it notes and that image that you shared. Um, so we really appreciate your time. We appreciate you breaking down each step throughout the framework and the process. And I know that I have some great ideas that I can take back and share amongst our team. I'm sure the other participants do as well. So again, thanks. We really appreciate it. And um, I hope everyone who was able to join for this presentation. We'll hang on. We have another presenter joining and another team member from Accelerant Research who's going to introduce our next speaker as well. Thanks so much, Jenny Lauren and Lorenzo.